but we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Carlin Kadeiri. Carlin is an associate professor and the chair of education in the Department of Mercy Medicine at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Kadeiri is really one of the leading educators in our specialty in emergency cardiology. She speaks at, at American College of Emergency Physicians and multiple other conferences nationally and internationally and locally. She is responsible for the third and fourth year medical students rotating through the department as well as 68 emergency medicine residents and helping to educate many of the faculty there as well. See there as well. There as well. There as well. She's been involved in, in editing several textbooks, authoring numerous papers and textbook chapters. And uh, she's currently completing a master's in education for the health professions uh, at Johns Hopkins, which is right across town. So if you, uh, Tarla, you should definitely drop by sometime. So anyway, Tarla, welcome to the Cardiology Symposium. Tarla's going to be speaking on deciphering dysrhythmias in devices. So Tarla, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, the world's longest um, master's degree, but eventually I'll get there. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to all the international um, audience. I'm going to do this. Let's see if we can get this going. And hopefully that is transmitting. It looks good. Looks good. Perfect. Looks good. Okay. So my goal uh, for this talk is basically for you all to become a little more comfortable the next time a patient with a pacemaker related problem or a defibrillator related problem walks into your emergency department and there's something going on with their uh, ECG. I personally get excited when these patients come in. I know not everybody feels that way. Um, you know, when they come in, I kind of look around the emergency department. I'm like, hey, who's taking, uh, who's going to grab this patient? Patient who's going to take this patient and uh, all I hear is crickets it's like quieter than a European cricket society meeting so my goal the next time someone with a pacemaker walks in is I want you to get excited I want you to grab that patient's chart which I just dated myself um, with charts or sign up for the patient but whatever the case may be I want you to just kind of throw yourself at this patient and feel comfortable um, going in so before we can identify dysrhythmias, we have to kind of know what normal looks like for a pacemaker patient. Um, and, a, and if you take a look at this particular EKG, this is a dual chambered pacemaker. And I know this because when I look along this rhythm strip at the bottom, I can see that there are atrial spikes and then I have a ventricular spike. This atrial spike results in, and it's a little hard to see here, but kind of a normal looking P wave. So it's upright in lead two and it immediately follows that atrial spike. The ventricular spike is followed by a wide QRS complex, and that is also normal in a paced patient, in a paced ventricle. And typically it's going to have a left bundle branch pattern. And theoretically, I mean, that makes sense in that that uh, ventricular lead is sitting in the right ventricle, and that's going to cause that right ventricle to depolarize first. And when that happens, it's going to look like a left bundle branch block pattern on the EKG. And so this is what a normal dual chambered pacemaker is going to look like on an ECG. A pacemaker spike for the um, atrial lead here, followed by a normal P wave, a normal morphology P wave, then the ventricular spike and then you get this wide QRS complex. So this is what normal looks like for a paced patient. Now contrast that to this particular ECG. And if I tell you that this patient has a pacemaker, you're going to be looking at this EKG, looking for those pacer spikes. But when I look at this, the first thing I notice, here's my rhythm strip along the bottom, is this is exceptionally slow. So I've got one, two, three, four, five QRS complexes on this. And so that's about a rate of 30 beats per minute, which is abnormally slow in a patient who should have a pacemaker and their pacemaker should be working. The other thing I notice here is I see P waves and I see those QRS complexes, but they don't seem to be going together. So something is wrong here in terms of the conduction system. And we've got a third degree heart block here for this patient. And then the question becomes, why am I not seeing the pacemaker work here? So if this patient is in third degree heart block and they have a pacemaker, why has that not fired up and why isn't it doing its job? 
So this is going to be the most common uh, pathology you will see with pacemakers, and it's going to be failure to pace. Essentially, when you look at that electrocardiogram, the pacemaker fails to deliver a stimulus, so you're not going to see pacer spikes. If you have a relatively stable patient, great, they're perfusing well, they're mentating well, their blood pressure is okay okay, then you're home free and you have some time to work. However, if the patient is an extremist, they're unstable, then you're going to need to do something. And so now I need to either get their pacemaker back online as quickly as possible, or I'm going to need to pace them myself externally. And so how am I going to figure out whether or not their pacemaker is, is working or not and what's going on and what happened? What cause this problem. The most common cause of failure to pace is oversensing. And basically, this means that the pacemaker is overwhelmed by external signals. And that can be either from a strong magnetic field, and you can see the sign here. Or these are, you'll see these at the airport as well when we go through um, security, if you've been in, in an airport recently, which I have not. Um, or it can happen for other reasons. So another um, uh, reason it's been in the case reports is putting a smartphone in your shirt pocket directly over that device can cause this sort of um, uh, interference for the pacemaker. Um, and then other normal activity can also cause oversensing or cause the pacemaker to get overwhelmed by external signals. For example, there are case reports of patients who've done push-ups, they've done sit-ups, and that external skeletal activity confuses the pacemaker. The pacemaker thinks that those are cardiac signals, and so it says, okay, you, you seem to be doing okay. You're generating your own electrical activity. You don't need me to work, when in reality, the patient's cardiac activity is nowhere near normal. Things like hiccups can cause um, oversensing. And then one way that we in the emergency department can cause oversensing in a patient with a pacemaker is when we give succinylcholine in the intubation process. And so those fasciculations that are generated after pushing succinylcholine can then cause oversensing for the pacemaker, and then it will then fail to pace. Now, what is the treatment for failure to pace the cardiac magnet? And you're going to need to slap this on that pacemaker as soon as you identify failure to pace in a patient who has symptomatic bradycardia. And this is why it's so critically important for you after this presentation to go back to your emergency department and figure out where is your cardiac magnet and where is that stored and how quickly can you get it? Who has access to it? If you can't find the magnet in your own emergency department for some reason, then other locations um, that you can look for uh, a magnet are the operating rooms or in the intensive care unit or in the coronary care unit. So other good locations for magnets. And if you happen to have a bad day and you need more than one magnet, then those are good locations to look for magnets as well. Now, what does the magnet do? And sometimes this is a little confusing for people as to, you know, what, what is exactly happening when I put a magnet on a patient? So what the magnet does is there's a ferromagnetic switch inside of a pacemaker or the ICD. When you apply the magnet to either of those devices, it flips that switch. When you flip that switch in the device, you set the pacemaker to asynchronous mode. Asynchronous mode means that you you are turning the sensing function of the device off. So if the pacemaker has its sensing function turned off, it is not going to see dysrhythmias, it's not going to see fast heart rates or slow heart rates, it's not going to sense anything. If it doesn't sense anything, it's the pacemaker is just going to start pacing, which is what we want in a patient who has failure to pace. I just want that pacemaker back online working again. So by putting that magnet on and turning the sensing function off on the pacemaker, I am firing up the pacemaker to just go ahead and start pacing. So it's not looking for anything. It's just going to pace. So in a patient with failure to pace, your solution is going to be your magnet. Now, 
if you put that magnet on the device, one of three things is going to happen. Either you're going to get no spikes, so the pacemaker doesn't come back online, and that is an indicator that the pacemaker is dead. Either the battery is dead or there is some problem with one of the components of the pacemaker. And so now you need to be prepared to externally pace the patient. Trying to float a transvenous pacer in a patient who's already got um, a pacemaker or ICD is exceptionally difficult. If you put the magnet on and the spikes are less than 65 beats per minute, so the pacemaker fires up, but the rate is relatively slow, that is an indication that the battery is running out of juice. And so it's great that you've got the pacemaker back online. That patient is going to need that pacemaker switched out. If you put the magnet on and the pacemaker fires up and the spikes are at a relatively normal rate, say 85 beats per minute, then you know that something interfered with that pacemaker, most likely over sensing, um, and that's what caused your failure to pace. And so that's great. You've got the pacemaker back online. Well done. Another life saved. So failure to pace, you're going to reach for that magnet and you are going to try to turn that sensing function off and fire up the pacemaker to start pacing the patient. Now take a look at this particular ECG. So another dysrhythmia in a patient with a pacemaker. What I see here is I see an atrial spike, and then I see this little P wave that has a relatively normal morphology. I see a ventricular spike, and then I see this wide QRS complex. Looks good to me. I'm happy. Here I see another atrial spike, a P wave, a ventricular spike, and then a wide complex QRS, which is what I expect to see. So I'm marching this out, atrial spike, P wave, ventricular spike, and something happened here. So I don't see a QRS complex the way I should. Moving on, I see that I'm back online again here with this atrial spike, P, ventricular spike, QRS, atrial spike, P, ventricular spike, and then another empty space. Same here. And so something is going on here. This is failure to capture. This is where the pacemaker delivers the stimulus. So it's doing its job, but the heart is not responding appropriately. So it's not generating either the P wave or the QRS the way that it should. So on the electrocardiogram, you're going to see pacer spikes, but you're not going to see a resultant P wave or QRS complex, depending on whether the issue is with failure to capture with the atrium or with the ventricle. This is another great EKG. And this really, I mean, with EKGs, the key here is to make sure you take the time out to really look at the ECG and try to convince yourself that everything is okay because if it's not you want to catch that earlier at first glance this looks great this looks very normal that you can see along the bottom here these are where the the spikes are happening and so if it's a little hard to see on the actual ekg i can take a look and see oh yeah here's the spike here's the spike so this is telling me where the um, pacemaker spikes should be happening this is a patient with a dual chambered pacemaker that came to our institution and this looks very regular the qrs looks appropriately wide um, and and so this makes me happy. But when I take a closer look at this ECG, you can see that there are a few abnormalities here. So for example, if I take a look at lead three here, I see there's a T wave here, and presumably this is my atrial spike. This is coming awfully close to the end of that T wave. There's basically no TP segment for this patient. So you have to ask yourself, why is the pacemaker trying to throw an atrial spike or generate a P wave so quickly after this T wave? Other examples of where there's a spike that shouldn't be. So if I take a look here, I can see that there is a spike in the middle of the T wave here. So again, this is an atrial spike that's happening in the middle of a T wave. That's not normal. So what I can tell is these ventricular spikes are generating an appropriate QRS complex and they're coming at very regular intervals, but I don't see atrial spikes that are corresponding to P waves in an appropriate fashion. Okay. And so this is clearly abnormal. And what would cause this? Why would my atrial lead be 
inappropriately firing at the wrong time. A chest x-ray was the solution here. And so once we got this portable chest x-ray on the patient, here is, this patient has a, um, an ICD, and I can tell because there's a big coil here in the ventricular lead. The right ventricular lead looks like it's in the right location, but this atrial lead, this should not be sitting here. The atrial lead should be in the atrium. And so what's happened is the atrial lead here has essentially gotten pulled back. And so it's still firing, but nowhere near where it needs to. And so that's why we're not seeing an appropriate P wave after that atrial spike. Here's another great example of uh, a uh, device that is the leads have have basically been pulled out and is nowhere near where it's supposed to be so you see all these wires coiled around the device here and then here are the atrial and ventricular leads so nowhere near where they are supposed to be this is a great example of twiddler syndrome and so this is where the pacemaker leads are manipulated by the patient um, they start twiddling the generator or twisting it and that can cause failure to pace or failure to capture typically in kids or in um, thin elderly women who don't have a lot of um, subcutaneous fat to um, anchor that uh, device. And so you're going to make that diagnosis on chest x-ray and the treatment is um, surgery and then replacing that, that device. And then we come to our third problem with um, pacemakers and dysrhythmias. And this is failure to sense. And what is failure to sense? The pacemaker or the ICD fails to recognize normal activity. It fails to recognize a normal P wave or a normal QRS complex. And what you can see here, for example, is I see this P wave here, and then I see an atrial spike here, which is then generating another P wave, and then the ventricular spike and a QRS complex. And so again, here's another normal P wave that the heart was able to generate on its own. For whatever reason, the pacemaker doesn't recognize it, doesn't sense it, and so it fires an atrial spike to generate another P wave, a ventricular spike, and a QRS complex. So this is an example of failure to sense um, for the atrial lead. And so when you look at the EKG, the pacer spikes are going to be present in spite of a normal P or QRS complex. And that's your clue that you're dealing with failure to sense. And so lots of different things can cause failure to sense, whether maybe the lead is in the wrong place or the, um, the pacemaker itself, the you know sensory function of it needs to be manipulated or reprogrammed. But this is a great example of failure to sense for the atrial um, lead. This was a great EKG that was sent to me um, by, by Todd Haber um, down in Florida. And what we see here is actually a patient who is in atrial flutter. Now they have a pacemaker in place as well. And what I see here is this is pretty fast um, for a pacemaker. And so what's happening here is the pacemaker, the ventricular pacemaker is responding to all of those flutter waves. And it's desperately trying to keep up with all of those flutter waves. And so you've basically got a tachycardia here with the pacemaker involved in the process. And so this pacemaker either needs to be replaced or reprogrammed so that it doesn't respond to all of these flutter waves. So another example of a dysrhythmia that is generated essentially by the patient themselves, but the, the uh, pacemaker is part of the problem as well in its attempt to respond to every single uh, atrial beat here. And when you upgrade the pacemaker or you reprogram the pacemaker for that particular patient, you can see that now all of those atrial flutter beats. And so now we are at a more normal rate. The patient is far more comfortable. And then Todd also sent this EKG, and so he knows I'm a, I'm a pacemaker ICD geek. And so um, he sent me these, um, these fabulous EKGs. So this is um, another pacemaker example here. And this is an example of pacemaker-mediated tachycardia. And this is, you can see this is exceptionally fast, and you can see the pacemaker is generating all of these ventricular beats here. And what happens with pacemaker-mediated tachycardia is that the pacemaker is part of a re-entrant tachycardia. 
tachycardia. The good news is that the rate of this tachycardia will never exceed the upper limit of the pacemaker. So whatever the upper limit of the pacemaker is set at, it will never exceed that, thankfully. It's usually precipitated by a PVC or by having put a magnet on a patient and then removing that magnet. And if that happens, then just put the magnet back on the patient again. But this is a nice schematic that kind of shows you a PVC um, basically fires, it gets conducted up towards the atrium, and then that retrograde P is sensed by the atrial channel, and then it shoots it down again to um, pace that RV again. And so you get this re-entrant tachycardia that the pacemaker is a part of. So the good news is that the treatment for this is just going to be the magnet. So put that magnet on and get that um, the pacemaker to stop sensing and to just fire at a normal rate. That is to be contrasted with this dysrhythmia. And this is um, an EKG that, that is used quite often. And this basically looks like V-fib when you take a look at this. And so this is a runaway pacemaker. This is where the pacemaker is just firing away willy-nilly. Unfortunately, the problem with runaway pacemaker... This is a generator malfunction, and the rate can far exceed the pacemaker limit. And so you, we're talking about 200s, 300s beats per minute, and that is not sustainable. It will degenerate into VTAC or VFib. The problem with this is if the patient is unstable and you need to act, the magnet is not going to help you here. And so this is one of those like crazy heroic things that we talk about and hopefully we never have to do, but you actually have to cut the pacemaker wires um, in these patients to basically get the device out of that um, runaway pacemaker mode and then you to take over and try to um, make sure that they continue with their normal cardiac activity afterwards great example of what a magnet does in a pacemaker and so you can see the pacemaker is kind of firing away here but once you place that magnet on it fires up the pacemaker to a higher rate and so put the magnet on the pacemaker when you see a patient who has symptomatic bradycardia and you know they have a pacemaker they should be going faster um, so failure to pace if you see no spikes it tells you that there's a problem with the device itself if the spikes are slow the battery is depleted and if the spikes are normal then you um, were dealing with a situation of over sensing and then the other indication for a magnet in a pacemaker is going to be that pacemaker mediated tachycardia cardia to stop that re-entrant loop. Really quickly, um, sometimes it gets a little confusing about when do I use a magnet in a pacemaker and when do I use it in an ICD. We said that with pacemakers, the magnet turns the sensing function off and tells the pacemaker to start pacing. It does the same thing in an ICD. So when you put the magnet on, you turn the sensing function of the device off. The problem with turning the sensing device of the ICD off is that the ICD, the cardioversion defibrillator portion, if you turn the sensing function off, the device will no longer detect dysrhythmias. So it's not going to see VTAC. It's not going to see VFib. And if it can't see those dysrhythmias, then it's not going to cardiovert and it's not going to defibrillate. So you are taking the life-saving device for this particular patient away from them when you put the magnet on an ICD. So before you put the magnet on, make sure that you have those external defibrillation pads on the patient and then put the magnet on for an ICD. You have to be prepared to externally defibrillate them yourself when you turn this particular sensing function off. So magnets and ICDs, when do we want to use that? So if the patient gets an inappropriate shock and you want to take the ICD offline and you don't want it shocking or cardioverting anymore, or if the patient is an extremist, they are getting CPR and you want to take over external defibrillation or cardioversion, then you don't want to be competing with their internal device. So put the magnet on, that will shut off the ICD, and then you can go ahead and external 
externally defibrillate or cardiovert your patient. Now, the device may make some sounds um, when you put the magnet on, and that kind of is an indicator to you. It's audible. You'll hear it um, that a magnet has been around the device, and it's telling you, like, hey, I'm about to go offline. So um, when you put the magnet on, it's going to emit um, a 10-second tone, um, and you'll hear that. If you hear a sound like a truck backing up, so it's like beep, beep, beep. So that's kind of a low urgency alarm. Um, and it's just indicating to you like, hey, something's going on. Not a big deal. Don't worry. I'm OK. Um, but just a heads up. And typically um, when we interrogate the device at that point, then we get an indication like, oh, maybe the patient um, got a cardioversion or a defibrillation by the device. If you hear what sounds like a police car, um, you know, so um, so that's a high urgency alarm. And that's indicating like there is badness. Something is wrong with the device and it may not actually be functional the way you want it to. Um, and so that's an indication to get um, your uh, electrophysiologist in the device needs to um, be checked out formally. So summary slide. You have time with these patients most of the time. And so really look at that ECG. Take a look at the rate. Is it slow? Is it normal? Or is it fast? And that will help tell you how the pacemaker is functioning. So if it's very, very slow, it shouldn't be. The pacemaker should be functioning. And then you know there's a problem. Grab the magnet, put it on the patient, and see if you can get that pacemaker back online. If it's normal, great. Then take a look at those actual pacer spikes. Should they be there? And I showed you that example of uh, the ventricular pacemaker with the atrial spikes that were sort of in the inappropriate place. So really look at those spikes, march them out, and make sure that they should be there. Um, are there P's and QRS's after every spike? Um, and then are the spikes appropriate? Do we want spikes to be there at the time that they're falling? The more the device works, the shorter the lifespan of the device. So really, in looking at these EKGs, you're trying to make sure that we can preserve the longevity of of the device um, for as long as we can. This is my Twitter handle and my email. Feel free to reach out um, and I'm happy to field any questions at this point. Well, thanks so much, Tarlin. Uh, that was, uh, we've gotten all, already a few comments from the audience that this was one of the very best pacemaker lectures. Hold on one second. Um, Tarlin can't hear you well because you need to be on Zoom for her. She's not on live stream. Give us a second, Carl. I've been having lots of sound issues today. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me, Tarlin? There you go. All right. Well, thanks so much, Tarlin. That was really a fantastic lecture. And I was just saying that we've already gotten a handful of comments from the audience that that was one of the very best pacemaker lectures ever. And uh, I have to tell you that I love EKGs, but our secret, I hate pacers. I really do. So anyway, I'm going to hand things over to Drs. Dubs and Fallot. They, there are a few questions that we have time for, and then we'll come back to some more questions at the very end. So give me just one second to get the microphone over to them. Hey, Dr. Hadaidi, that was awesome. Thank you so much for a really fantastic talk. So one of our first questions is, um, is pacemaker malfunction ever caused by ACS? And do these patients need to be ruled out? I'm going to go ahead and ask that question one more time. Hi, Dr. Hidayati. Thank you so much for, uh, for an awesome talk. We really enjoyed that. So first question is, is pacemaker malfunction ever caused by ACS? And do these patients need to be ruled out? You got to turn up the audio, please. All 
ischemic tissue that the pacemaker is trying to work through and it's unable to, to kind of reach the destination. Um, so you definitely want to keep um, ischemia in the back of your mind in terms of a, a reason why the pacemaker may not um, be able to, to capture in particular or pace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good question. And I think we have one more time for one more question. What do you do with a pacemaker in cardiac arrest? Should we do anything to get a picture of what's really going on? So typically in a patient who is um, in cardiac arrest, I like to take over the defibrillation myself. So if I have to deliver shocks. And so at that point, I will um, put a magnet on the ICD. I don't want to compete with the ICD because that's also trying to uh, defibrillate if um, there's something like, you know, unstable VTAC or VFib happening. And so in an effort to not sort of have dueling devices, um, I will turn off the sensing function of the ICD, so it's not going to deliver um, any cardioversion or defibrillation, and then I will go ahead and defibrillate myself externally. Um, you just want to make sure that you don't put your um, pads directly over the device. The goal is to um, you know, get the patient back and then preserve their device, um, and so just make sure that you're, you're not directly putting those pads right over the ICD. Thank you. Great points. Any other questions, Cheyenne? Any points on the pre-hospital management of pacemaker issues? Can you comment briefly on overdrive pacing? So with the, you know, in the pre-hospital arena, the goal is always, you know, I'm like, just get the patient here as quickly as possible so I can see um, what's going on. If the um, EMTs want to take over um, the pacemaker function, so there's some sort of malfunction happening, particularly if it's um, either failure to pace or pacemaker mediated tachycardia, then by all means, you know, if there's a magnet, put the magnet on and then take over pacing. Um, if the pacemaker is looks like it's functional and you know it's it's not pacemaker mediated tachycardia and it's not a failure to pace um, then you're going to be limited in terms of what you can do in the back of an ambulance trying to pace on top of the pacemaker is going to be exceptionally challenging so you have to put the magnet on um, if it's an ICD, if it's a if it's a um, pacemaker mediated tachycardia, put the magnet on. But we don't have a way to take the pacemaker offline um, and get it to stop pacing completely. Um, if it's an issue with that, I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much. <laughs>